mic check, please. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ducks Limit Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jennings. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Brazier. My name is John Gordon. I'll be your host. And I'm your host, Katie Burke. Welcome to the Ducks Unlimited Podcast, the only podcast about all things waterfowl. From hunting insights to science-based discussions about ducks, geese, and issues affecting waterfowl and wetlands conservation in North America, we bring the resource to you, the DU Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ducks Unlimited podcast. I'm your host on this episode, Mike Brazier, and joining me on the line is a, a past guest and a guy who's got a lot of really cool information, information that, that waterfowl hunters just crave, uh, especially this time of year. Dr. Phil Loretsky with the University of Texas, El Paso. Phil, welcome back, man. Yeah, thanks for having me uh, uh, this morning. I'm, uh, I'm excited to talk about hybrids again. We've talked a little bit about this on some past episodes, but this time of year, we see a lot of images from social media about people having harvested a hybrid. And, and then invariably, you look into the comments and people start asking questions. And I occasionally get a, uh, get a message or an email, people asking me about, about hybridization. And one of the common questions is like, are these hybrids sterile? And where does sterility kind of, um, or, or fertility, I guess the the inverse of that, where does that kind of begin to break down on, on some of these hybridizations? And so, um, rather than me, you know, try to make something up or have to spend a whole lot of time researching it uh, to get the the accurate answer, I said, man, the easy thing for me to do is just to get Dr. Phil Lavretsky on the phone and. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, kind of a pointed question, and, and, and that is, are waterfowl hybrids sterile? And if not, you know, kind of where does it, where does it, in, where does all that break down, I guess you would say? Um, so what can you tell us, I guess, at a high level? Let's start here. How much has this been researched? How much do we know about it in general? I mean, a whole lot and not a whole lot all at once. What we understand is that out of all the bird groups, right? So ducks are one of the oldest groups of birds. And yet 60% of waterfowl species still hybridize in nature. And if you put them into captivity and play the right song, you get almost up to 80% of bird species, of duck species that are able to hybridize with one or more of uh, other types of ducks, geese, and swans. So it seems that there isn't this similar breakdown that, you know, you've got a mule all of a sudden and, it, you know, your first generation hybrid, if you hybridize uh, uh, a horse and a donkey and you got a mule, but it's sterile, right? That doesn't seem to exist in birds more generally. And there's a variety of reasons for this. But in ducks in particular, they are uh, notorious to be able to still make you know, as far as we can tell, uh, um, viable offspring. And where does that break down? That's a hard question. There isn't a ton of studies in captivity where they just go generation after generation and try to figure out, all right, when does an individual become sterile? Because potentially in the wild, this never really was taken away from them as it was more important that a female choosing a mate sees this hodgepodge individual and actually chooses against it. So maybe uh, through time, there was never a real cause for alert to be sterile because those hybrids didn't get to breed all that often anyways um, in the past. And so that is, that's one of the hypotheses as to why ducks in general just are able to hybridize so readily uh, amongst the different groups. And, and of course, one of those groups, one of those ducks is the mallard that basically breeds with everything, including humans. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's, I think that's, you're making that up. That, that's the short of it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we're going to try to break this down kind of at some points and let's see if we can process of elimination and just for some, you know, maybe key talking points. Uh, if let's say a mallard 
hybrid uh, were to mate with a goose. Has there been any documentation of that? No, it does break down there. So you could you could say it breaks down there, but I mean, you've got mallard wood duck, right? Those are two different genera. But but let me let me back you up. So a mallard a mallard could attempt to mate with a Canada goose in in theory, right? I guess so. But yes. yeah, but it would not have it would not result in successful fertilization of an egg. Is that the proper interpretation? I don't know. No, yeah, I can't imagine that would work. But I don't have any data, and I don't think there are data that that is actually like no, this doesn't work. Um, but I imagine it doesn't because there's two steps in this in this you know or maybe three. Yeah. However many, I guess three if you actually want to talk about kind of the the process of of the the mating itself. But then the question is, okay, is does it result in a viable egg? And then right. if hatched, is that offspring fertile? And and you know even if that it is able to kind of lead to a fertile egg or, or a, a viable egg and produce the young, that would certainly seem to be the point at which that offspring would not be fertile, right? Correct. Yeah, nobody's ever looked at uh, between like a swan, a goose, and a, and, a, and a duck. I don't think that's ever been done. If it has, I'm not familiar with it. Maybe some breeders have tried it, but my guess my my guess would be that that that's where it breaks down. But within the groups, within those groups, they pretty readily hybridize, and they can produce those kind of interspecific breeding to yep. will lead to a viable egg. It can be hatched and produce yes. a hybrid offspring. Yes. And then the question is, where does that you know the the fertility of that offspring begin to, to break down. Um, and so the way yeah. I, I was kind of thinking about this, Phil, is that within the taxonomic grouping of waterfowl, we have kind of what are called tribes. Um, we have a dabbling duck tribe. We have a diving duck tribe. We have a sea duck tribe. We have a, a perching duck tribe. And of course, there's a whole bunch of others. Do we know, like, so within a tribe, let's say mallard, pintail, mallard, black duck, there's a yeah. pretty high de- pretty high probability that a hybrid offspring within that tribe is would have the uh, would be fertile. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah, I mean, Brewer's duck was originally uh, identified as a as its own species until we realized that those were just mallard gadwall crosses, right? And it, it obviously happens readily enough. It happens throughout time and and we know it happens throughout time because we find ancestral gene flow between these groups um, in, in more broader senses. And so, yeah, there's no reason that the that those hybrids are breaking down. Where the breakdown becomes typically what we see, what happens in these scenarios is you start seeing sex ratio disparities where you have more males than females. It's called Haldane's rule. It's what we expect because typically what you see is sex chromosomes are the first things that can't kind of work together. And so, uh, an XY in people or a ZW in in ducks um, would be the first sex that breaks down. So then all of us in in ducks and waterfowl, the the ZW would be um, the female. So you would expect to start seeing a lower production of females if the hybrid females, right? And potentially that's why people shoot hybrids and they're like, look at this thing, and it's always a male. But then the alternative is that. Those are the ones we can see, right? We can't, it's harder for people to be like, oh, look at this brown duck. It's a hybrid. <laughs> That's um, right. It's, a, it, it's, it's harder for that. So, you know, there's probably a bias there. But yeah, I mean, the, uh, as far as we can tell, the breakdowns occur maybe later. It's not, a, the F1 can definitely breed. Uh, will it breed is another question. Does it mate, is it successfully able to mate pair or is there a strong mating against it or a sort of negative assertive mating is what we call it against these guys. And so, you know, yeah, they can breed, but they don't get the chance. So mallard wood duck hybrid in theory, would that offspring be be fertile? In all intents and purposes, I don't see why not. Yeah. Okay. Because there's a lot of, I think I've even heard people say, yeah, that if there's a wood duck involved in hybridization, that offspring is is going to be sterile. But you're saying that's that's not likely to be the case based on what we know. What we know, right. So you'd have to watch. I mean, the problem with studying this in captivity is, you know, if you just care about whether they make a viable offspring, that's a good, that's a good case to do it in captivity. But if you want to see 
does the hybrid in natural settings actually make a viable offspring? You actually have to watch it because potentially they may they they can, but they don't get the chance because they're pick, they're not picked, right? They're not they don't get to mate. That being said, uh, the reason that these guys, I just just getting into the genetic part, the reason that these guys are so are able to hybridize, and unlike mammals or ch- lots of tree species, is their genomes are so conserved. They've been the same. You know, there there isn't large changes that cause issues during uh, uh, egg formation that we know of, because I can take a wood duck genome and a mallard genome and align them. And that means there aren't huge differences that that would stop, that would make an egg inviable, as far as I can tell. So let me ask you a question here, maybe about the anatomy, uh, how hybridization affects the anatomy such that we would get to a point where the the offspring are are sterile uh, and maybe share what you know about about a mule like why it, why can a mule not not reproduce what is it missing is it poorly developed um reproductive yeah. organs is it does it lack eggs is it like the sperm what's missing yeah mules is a great example right so you've got you've got a horse and a donkey that actually have uh, quite the different genetics and when you combine them to create a mule you really do while you have an offspring, a true hybrid offspring, they're naturally sterile. So, so mules can be males or females, uh, but both of them are naturally sterile, meaning that the eggs and the sperm that they do produce, if they produce them, are going to be malfunctioning. So sperm will have missing tails, missing heads. The eggs will be malformed or, or uh, not, not able to receive sperm. And so that, that is the case of actual natural sterility that we see quite often in in mammals do we know if that same thing happens in in some of these more obscure uh, waterfowl hybrids that's a good question my my thought actually just came to the fact that right so ducks uh so waterfowl have uh vaginas and penises and so and they have those spirals right yeah and so most likely the real problem is is every species that has evolved a particular spiral and particular way that a male and a female join together. And hybrids probably can't get to uh, the location where their sperm would actually reach the egg. That would be my guess is the, pro- is the biggest problem, what might cause them sort of sterility. But that would be sort of functional sterility, not necessarily... Functional. functional. In, yeah, not, not necessarily physiological sterility. So that's kind of where, where my Correct. mind is going. I'm wondering if we know who, uh, how much we know about that. I realize I'm catching you kind of cold with some of these, but it's, it's sort of fun just to explore um, where our minds yeah. go and trying to piece together what actually, what what the mechanism might be for some of this, you know. And um, let's see, you've answered most of my questions. Any other examples uh, that, any other examples that you encounter a lot um, that, that you wonder about or any other questions that you get missed that you have to kind of debunk in this, in this field? For hybridization, yeah. I mean, there's two things that, that, that have very well been debunked, not just in ducks, but in general um, across mammals and, and other organisms is that hybridization is a natural process. Like this is a thing that occurs. So for example, we had a, we have a paper that showed uh, the Stellar's eider is actually a hybrid that eventually turned into what we consider the seller's eider between a long-tailed duck and eiders, true eider, so an eider ancestor, right? So this is a thing that occurs throughout time. So that's one thing that the community in large has really found is that hybridization and gene flow, the movement of genes between organisms, has been an important process. Um, but the other thing that that seems to be the case for birds is a lot of the hybridization we think stems from extra pair copulation. It isn't like females are picking correctly, but then a hybrid male might attempt a mating and get some form of you know fecundity from that uh, it, through that extra pair copulation attempts. That seems to be the primary instigator of mo- of of where hybrids actually get get some babies. Um, that being said, I mean we've got a study on black ducks and mallards, and and yeah, hybrids hybrids definitely still mate pair with a black duck um, at a very low rate, but it is possible, and it depends on the location. So hybrids, you know, they they're definitely out there. How they how they interact is uh, is, is something that we still don't know. 
because they're hard to study. It's not like I can go find a a hundred hybrids and and watch them and monitor them. But I think that this is going to take a whole slew of new techniques or, or 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 methods to be able to really answer. Nobody's really asked those questions because we always we always thought dogmatically that you know hybrids are sterile or hybrids are. Are, are these non-functional entities, but it doesn't seem that way. That's really interesting. And, and of course, the other thing that you've kind of already talked about, but I'll, I'll sort of draw it out a little bit more here, is that even though these hybrids, as we've talked about here, are likely fertile, we don't see... We don't see a great, we, at least we don't think there's, for the for the most part, many of those hybrids, it, especially if they're pretty far away from one species to the other, they're probably function, functionally sterile because of what you described. You Correct. know, they're, they're, yeah. their courtship behavior, their calls may be a little bit different. They may just look a little weird to the, to the females that are out there of a more pure yep. species. And so they don't get those opportunities very often, but they would in theory still be, we think, uh, fertile. Now, to draw a bit of a of a contrast to that, we look at hybridization between mallards, black ducks, mallards, model ducks, mallards, Mexican ducks. Those species are so closely related that their their vocalizations, their courtship uh, behaviors are similar enough that there is more of that that pairing between a hybrid and one of the parent species, um, and then they can produce viable offspring. If you have that F1 hybrid back crossing with with the parent, um, you get viable offspring there, right? Did I say all that correctly? Yeah, no, that's absolutely correctly. I mean, when we look at it, it we what you typically see, so if, if, it, if it really did stop at an F1, all you'd see is like uh, uh, – Hybrids would always just be like a 50-50 genetically, right? If you think of your ancestry. Um, and But what we see with those guys is basically uh, splattering from one parent to the other, right? So that means there's everything and anything in between. So that's hybrid, hybrid combinations and, and, and so forth. And so that suggests there isn't a breakdown. Uh, genetically, there isn't a breakdown. But like you said, um, you know, when we're looking at wild mallard wild you know model duck or that hybridization rate is still only five percent we showed that uh for florida and west gulf coast and and the folks at lsu also showed it with a larger sample size for west gulf coast that's about five percent so a lot less than we expected and when we look at it more more closely a lot of that hybridization is actually due to game farms uh due to domestic domestic strains of the are appear to be the real problem, the ins- the real instigator. So that tells me, yeah, they're they're all together. They're functionally able to create babies, but if it was a natural process, it would happen fairly infrequently. Five uh, percent is typically what we see in any bird complex, um, and so and so and so increasing rates ha- is due to uh, other sources, is what we find. And all things eventually lead back to game farm mallards. <laughs> it seems that's my entire life. I just have to give a whole seminar on it. Yeah. So the other thing, just to kind of close this out, make sure we talk about geese a little bit. Yeah. Geese can hybridize. Yes. Um, and we would expect within that, within the goose family, that the the offspring would be would be fertile, right? Yeah. No. Uh, uh, Yenti Ottenborough and, and others in in Europe have done some phenomenal work, both in captivity and, and of natural. Um, of population summarizing what we've what we know and and viability and yeah I mean they've they've had Bronta which would be your Canada goose and Answer which is your you know snow geese and others that you know in captivity they can make viable offspring so in the wild not so you know I think there's actually been reports of them but uh, in captivity for sure they've seen they're able to produce viable offspring meaning that even those groups aren't breaking down yet. It doesn't break down for them. Now, I'm sure that offspring is functionally inept, but they can create offspring. You can't tell from the genome right now whether it's it's viable or not, can you? Have you gotten that dialed in yet? Uh, no. I mean, I don't have all of them, so no. Yeah. <laughs> One day. And can you identify these F2 hybrids? Let's say if, we, if you built large enough database, and I know a lot of the research that you're doing, and we've talked about a few other things too. If you built a large enough database, could you in theory occasionally come across, let's say, an F2 hybrid? Let's say it's a, it's the offspring of a mallard pintail hybrid that would have backcrossed with, oh, I don't know, let's say a, a female mallard. Would you be able to pick that up, you think? Yeah. 
Yeah, really? we would okay. be able to pick it up. That's super cool. Yeah, no, our uh, our te- our techniques are are enough that for the F one we can. W- the nice thing is we can just trace the mitochondrial lineage if it's a true F one, uh, and then we can reconstruct that those the, who the mom and who the dad was. And then uh, after that, it becomes a bit tricky to figure out who the mom and who the dad was, but we know who they back crossed to. So if we know if it's a male, then if it was shot, it was a male, it was a second year, and it's like an 80-20, then we, we can figure out, we, we can figure out parentage from that as well. And so we can keep going back in time until they're, uh, until they're parental or varieties of hybrid again. All right. That is some super cool stuff. Phil, I appreciate you hopping on the phone in very short notice today. Um, this was like, it's been, what, less than 12 hours almost since we <laughs> <laughs> since I contacted you and said, hey, you got time for a conversation? So I appreciate your responsiveness, man. It's been, it, it's a great topic. It's uh, of, of high importance. I, high interest this time of year fuels a lot of comments, a lot of inter- interaction with uh, across the hunting community, especially on social media these these days. And so, I hope folks find, and I know folks will find this information useful. And just yet another thing that we can with, that we can equip people with as they go out and have these fascinating conversations in the duck fly. No, absolutely. Thanks for uh, thanks for texting me last night, and and uh, we put this thing together quickly. So. Always happy to talk about ducks and ducks and hybridization and ducks in general. So thanks a lot, Phil. Have a great day. Uh, have a great weekend. Very special thanks to our guest on today's episode, Dr. Phil Oretsky with the University of Texas El Paso. Our our one of our our key genetic genetics experts in the waterfowl field uh, worldwide. Uh, we appreciate having such great access to him. Appreciate him coming on uh, and sharing his expertise. As always, we thank our producer, Chris Isaac, for the wonderful work that he does on these episodes. And we thank you, the listener, for your time and for your interest in the podcast. And we thank you for your support of wetlands and waterfowl conservation. Thank you for listening to this episode of the DU Podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit www.ducks.org slash DU podcast for resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes. Opinions expressed by guests do not necessarily reflect those of Ducks Unlimited. Until next time, stay tuned to the Ducks. Stay tuned to the Ducks. Stay tuned to the Ducks.